Thanks for tuning in with former Michigan Governor Jennifer Granholm in the queue talking about you know what. So is he getting a bum rap on this yes, story? Is yes, the media yes, overplaying this? Yes, yes, yes. Our lead story, Michigan Democrats. What are they doing about President Biden? Around the OTR table, Chuck Stokes, Zoe Clark, and Craig Monger. Sit in with us as we get the inside out off the record. Production of Off the Record is made possible in part by Martin Waymeyer, a full service strategic communications agency, partnering with clients through public relations, digital marketing, and public policy engagement. Learn more at martinwaymeyer.com. And now, this edition of Off the Record with Tim Skubik. Thank you very much. A busy week in our town as uh, we uh, talk to you on this Friday morning from Studio C. Uh, uh, Ms. Clark, let's talk Mr. about the. Stubik? Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay. <laughs> and now we have the formalities on the way. Hey, two can play this game. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> You're served. Um, it's fraying around the edges, the Michigan support for Biden. Yeah. It's not serious yet. It has not no. reached critical mass. No, I mean, it's it's a bit of a little mini microclimate of what we're seeing nationally, right? Where we're, as of now, taping Friday morning, there's a little more than a dozen uh, House Democrats, U.S. House Democrats, who have come out now and called on the president to step down. And we should all be clear, pretty much they're all saying he should step down. But if he doesn't, we're still 100 percent going to vote for him in support. And so on Thursday, uh, we saw West. Michigan Congresswoman Hillary Skolton, the first Michigan member of the congressional delegation, come out and basically kind of say the exact same thing, which was, I think it's time for the president to step down for the best of the party and for the country. But of course, if he doesn't, I will still, you know, support him. Um, and so this this was interesting, certainly, uh, you it's know, it's a blip. Well, this is this is what everyone was watching, particularly after Thursday night's press conference um, is was that going to sort of be the thing that allowed more House Democrats to say publicly what all of them are saying privately? It's more it's more than a blip, though. Hillary Skolton represents an absolutely essential district to Joe Biden. If he does not do well in Kent County, he will not win Michigan. That, that, those are her voters. The last two presidential elections, where did Donald Trump end his campaign? In the Chicago. entire campaign, hmm. Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids could be the key to Michigan. If you've got the congresswoman there casting doubt on the Democratic presidential candidate, that's a massive problem. And it points to this, this national issue that the Democrats have. There are some key Democratic office holders who are now criticizing their party's own nominee, but the base of the party is still with him. You have Detroit Democrats. He's got to do well in Detroit. They're coming out in support of him. African-American leaders are standing by Joe Biden. The Democrats are caught here. How do they get out of this? You are right. I was wrong. I unblipped that. Okay. <laughs> that's a first right there. I got to say. And to your point, uh, she, as well as Representative Phil Skaggs, are both from the west side of Michigan, and they are in districts that, in her district, Democrats haven't represented it since the 1970s. Mm. So you could make the argument she has to play it that way because she is in such a marginal district that could flip back to Republicans at the drop of a hat. Well, here's what's look at. We have two Democrats in the Michigan House, OK, and came out a day or so yeah. later, 14 Democrats led by the Speaker of the House. We'll match your two. And now I got 12 more. Uh, this thing is going to go on and on until when? Until the Republican convention starts on. <laughs> I, I mean, I think, of, and, I, and I say that seriously because I think a lot of the news media attention will then turn to the Republican convention. And I think what the Biden administration is doing right now is trying its best to get to the start of the Republican convention to take some of this attention off of him. I think some of this will be do, it's, it's taken off the fact that he had what I think most people felt was a good press conference uh, on Friday. He showed his command for foreign affairs in a way that you you just got to believe Donald Trump would not be able to do because he doesn't have that depth of experience. He hasn't been a past Senate chair of the Foreign Relations Committee. So those were Biden's strengths. He showed those strengths. But there are still a lot of Democrats. You know, I like to say Democrats like to speed date their candidates where Republicans like to marry them. And they're still out there looking for that Camelot, that John Kennedy, that Obama, that, that Clinton. And this is a complete 
antithesis of this. This is a man who's 81 years old. There was a, an internal timeline in D.C. for all of this, and that's because of NATO, that there was the huge NATO conference, and you certainly just cannot have a U.S. president uh, decide that they're not running in the middle of a NATO conference a day beforehand. It's done now. And so there was this sort of internal deadline, and this is why uh, last night's press conference happened when it did. And again, privately, a lot of folks talking about had the president not done well enough on Thursday night, a, a lot of Congress folks even had draft releases ready to go to be sent, basically saying he needed to step down. He did well enough to keep him in for longer, but to your point about a timeline, you know, that well enough gets the campaign another day, another two days. You've got a Lester Holt interview coming up on Monday night. Again, as we're talking about, Biden will actually be in Detroit uh, a Friday night. This is this is, you know, we're, we're measuring in hours here, not by, you know, weeks at also this point. Interesting. Uh, Governor uh, Governor Whitmer said that it wouldn't hurt if he did a test. And he finally found the right answer last night, which was, if my docs tell me to do it, I'm going to do it, which is what he should have said on the ABC interview. But mm -hmm. speaking about the governor, she's got a book out. Have you heard? For $26.99 from Simon Schuster, Governor Gretchen Whitmer's first book outlines her survival lessons that she's learned over the years in her private life and in the shark-infested political waters of Michigan. In the 159-page book, she is clear being governor has not gone to her head. You know what? I'm still the same person I was a year ago or 10 years ago. The governor reflects on her battles with Donald Trump over COVID and with legislative Republicans who fought her tooth and nail. And through it all, she steadfastly refused to return the political attacks. Her life lessons also include taking nothing personal, trying to be nice to everybody, and not running away from controversy. And of course, never giving up. The governor is big into her family. She says she would die for her two daughters. And to this day, she still consults with her dad. Yeah, I mean, he's someone that is a, um a, you know, incredibly good friend, but also someone who did a lot of accomplished things in the business world that, that I seek his advice regularly. When the governor's mother was dying of cancer, daughter Gretchen took care of her, raised a new baby, and learned the political ropes all at the same time. But she and her mom, well, she explains in the book, they had some issues growing up. Were you a rebellious teenager? Yes. Whoa. I was a pain. I was strong-minded. I know that's going to shock you. Strong-minded, which is code for? Uh, recalcitrant. Obstinate. Yeah. And I, I was a lot of fun to be around. <laughs> 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 I, had a, I had a robust social life. So robust that she got drunk on a high school football game, she reveals, and barfed on the school principal's shoes. The governor finally got her academic act together at MSU and law school. And she writes, at the end of the day... I'm not any better than anyone else. I'm not any worse either. In other words, what you see is what you get. <laughs> All right, so the, the barf story, you're telling me that's not true? Or I mean, I, I, can't, I can't vouch for this, but the, the principal has come out in another media outlet and said he does not recall and doesn't believe she threw up on him. So I, I, I'm not reporting <laughs> that. Well, no, but, well, let me just... There were cameras <laughs> back then, right? Well, well, she I was can't just, there's been a debate well. about barfing and off the record. I'm like, <laughs> well, you know, we've uh, reached a new high. Okay. Oh. <laughs> uh, she was suspended for three days, uh, somebody said. Look, at if that's, you were a principal in Somebody barfed on your shoes. Wouldn't you think you'd remember that, Ms. Clark? I know. Let's talk about the book. Well, Sorry. we're talking about the book. What did, what, did you, what did you find out new in the book? Oh, there were a, there were a number of new things. about look, we we uh, many of us have covered this governor for a very long time. She is funny. She is dynamic. She's quick on her feet. And I think this book was an introduction to the nation on who she is. This is a very different political book, I think you could argue, than many of these. Sort Sort of autobiographies that we read, or even the one it was that came not out. a deep dive. And, it, it, and she has said that it was not meant to be. I think in every inter I mean, she lets and again, she has done every media interview. It feels like this, this week, a, this right? This is a great gig that they this put together. This is an introduction to the nation, and she is uh, introducing herself in a very interesting way. What we usually see is these books that are sort of, you know, about here's my belief about foreign policy, and here's how this thing that happened ponderous. to me and ponderous. Um, and instead, what she's calling again in these many is that this is sort of a handbook, right? And that you can pick up one chapter in the middle of the book and, you know, laugh and get her playlist. Um, 
um, uh, there were I, no Motown sounds on that list. <laughs> that, that, that broke my heart. Shame Shame on her. Didn't that hurt you? <laughs> the Shame second book, Tim. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think again, this is much more about introducing the personality and the person than it is about policy or beliefs uh, about sort of the future of what she wants this and country don't you to think be. That was because coming out of the pandemic, she had an image of being so hard, so rigid. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they wanted to loosen up that persona of her and mm -hmm. show that if indeed she does get to the national stage or tries to run for an office on the national stage, that she, she's a human being, she has personality, as she said in your interview, she was a fun person to be around, that there is a much lighter side and a much more interesting side than just the policy walk. I'm going to follow COVID to the line. Yeah, I mean, I a couple of points on the book. I, I think there's a lot more to be said here. I mean, the governor, as she is in interviews, she doesn't always put forward the most detailed information about how she arrives at political decisions. I don't think she's fascinated by that, and she doesn't understand why we're interested in that. So there's not a lot in there about uh, some of the major choices she's made as the state's governor. However, I think it is so refreshing to see someone on the political stage who's willing to make fun of themselves. I mean, we just don't have that now. We have political candidates who are angry yeah. a lot of the time. And, and here you have someone who is out there. The book is a lot of stories people would be embarrassed to tell of themselves, and she's just dumping them out there with a laugh. So family is very important to her. I, the, the line about I would die for my two daughters, I mm -hmm. thought was touching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's obvious that they're a very, very close family. I think humor is something, I mean, there's stories, uh, a lot of humorous stories about her and her mm -hmm. siblings. Um, How you, about the salty language? Didn't we all know could, this could about you, this could governor? <laughs> could you imagine? The world knew about could you imagine Rick knew. Snyder talking about Shark Week? Oh yeah, no, no, for many reasons. But to, to Craig's point, I mean, this is um, particularly in light of b b where that story came from. No, but again, I think this is this governor who, who, I mean, look, you can even hear. So this whole week, she's been doing the media. Her newest thing that she's talking about, she keeps saying Joe Biden has the receipts. Like, this is a, a youthful thing that, you know, she probably, like, heard that phrase from her daughters and now has picked it up and using it. And I think this, For again— For those who don't know what it means, tell them. The proof that Joe Biden has the proof of what he's done, right? Um, she speaks— um, in, in also not, a, you know, in a non-political politician way. When we're talking about trying to be real, it reminds me a lot in 2000 with George W. Bush and everyone kept saying he's the, the president we want to have a beer with, right? And Gretchen Whitmer uh, has always sort of been that. And I think, again, as I keep saying, this introduction to the nation, yeah. that is how she's introducing and she herself. And she might even And she probably, yeah. <laughs> because she has a robust social I mean, life. It's, it's, it's fascinating to have New Gavin Newsom, the California yes. governor, who people think could be running against Whitmer for the Democratic nominee. Yeah. He was in Michigan recently. Yeah. I, I got to be there and ask him a couple questions. Yeah. And I, I was just, he would sit there all day, yeah. I, I thought, if, if his people allowed him to, and talk about politics all day if we had wanted to. He would have talked, sat there for an hour and answered every well, question. Just very quickly, yeah. too, sorry. She's, he's almost the only one that she actually takes a slight little Dig in, yes. in the book, which is, which is, which is fascinating. Yes. 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 Which which is, your competition wait, very that. different, yeah. very different different people and uh, it will be fascinating uh, if they run into the tattoos yeah. you know and it, it, in a generation where young people are getting tattoos like it's nobody's business. I think it was her way of saying, yeah, I'm cool too. I've got tattoos. I'll talk about two of them in the book. One of them I'm not going to talk about. All right. So speaking of governors, uh, let's take a look at an interview we did on Thursday. Thanks to our people from Channel 6 in Lansing with Governor Jennifer Granholm. Remember her? Uh, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is an interesting exchange. Let's take a look. Madam Secretary, welcome. It's good to see you. Great to see you, too. You're in, you're in the state doling out some money. You're sort of Santa Claus in July. Yeah. Uh, your critics are going to say, look, this looks like just a political ploy, oh. dumping some money in Michigan in, in order to get votes. Listen, we, the president's Invest in America agenda, which is, consists of three basic bills, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the Chips and Science Act, requires us to be able to give grants for particularly, in this case, reshoring or creating jobs in manufacturing in, in Michigan does, and in other states, too. It's require, Michigan's not the only one. Does it require you to do it in an election year? 
Well, you have to get the money out. I mean, you have to. You well, can't just you sit on six, it. Why didn't you do it six months ago? Well, because we, we put it out for bid six months ago. You know, the law is only two years old. So you have to set up a new program. You've got to get information. You've got to get notice of intent, et cetera. It's just part of the process. So this is all part of what was planned anyway. We have to get this money out the door. And we would be criticized if we sat on it, of course. So anyway, what the exciting news about this is that what we are doing in this case in Lansing, the Grand River Assembly plant was slated to close. And so what we are doing, not just in Lansing, but across the country in these industrial sites, is to say if you convert to uh, electric vehicle manufacturing, we'll give you a grant to help you retool. And so it's $500 million to help Grand River. It's, it's almost $2 billion uh, overall that we are uh, announcing this week to be able to help retool for electric vehicles. But some of your critics might also say this EV industry looks a little shaky right now. Why are you pouring mm. money perhaps down a rat hole in an easy EV segment that goes go south. This doesn't go south, though. It continues to increase. I mean, well, it's not just, going north right now. Oh, it is, though. I mean, you talk to GM, their sales quarter over quarter increased 40%. Well, yeah, but Ford's compared increased to zero, 60%. wait a second, compared to well, zero. Well, they have been selling zero. I mean, you know, I mean, I've been driving a Chevy Bolt, for example, for years. So, no, this is what the exciting part is. For the first time, and we haven't had an industrial strategy as a nation, right? All the states. You remember when I was governor, we were trying to compete with China. We're trying to compete with Mexico. So now you've got a partner in the federal government that says we're going to bring me manufacturing back. And in this case, we know that from all of the analysis that the clean energy sector is going to be a 23 trillion dollar global market by 2030. And you better believe the U.S. should be in the game. Now we pass these bills. We are the envy of the world because we are getting all of this investment. In Michigan alone, 52 factories have opened up because of the incentives embedded for manufacturing in the United States in America. So for Michigan, this is great news uh, and we're going to continue to do that great news. So what date do you hit the 50 percent part of the market is EVs? Um, well, the goal is to have 50% uh, of new cars sold by 2030. And I thought so, that date changed. Uh, well, I mean, the OEMs, some of the OEMs may have moved it one way or the what other. OEMs? Oh, uh, sorry, the original equipment manufacturer, the auto, me, I'm sorry, the automakers, know you know that. Uh, <laughs> the automakers <laughs> uh, have, you know, maybe moved their targets around. But overall, we expect that 50% of new cars sold will be electric by 2030. So the administration is working on this holistic strategy. Part of it is on the supply side, meaning we want to build all of those vehicles and the guts to those vehicles, which include the batteries, and that's like the ultimate battery factory that is also coming uh, here in Lansing and the guts to the batteries but it's also we want to make the demand side meaning we want to lower the prices of those vehicles so that people buy them and so now because of the incentives embedded in the Inflation Reduction Act we are seeing uh, that EVs and internal combustion engines are on par. And in many cases, EVs are less, depending on the model. So we want to do that. And we want to work on the infrastructure, meaning the charging stations around the country. All of those pieces are being worked on. Right, so obviously, we do have to talk about politics. You are inhibited in some way by the Hatch Act, which mm -hmm. limits what you can say. But let's start out with this. How does President Whitmer sound to you? Um, I think she would be an amazing president at some point. Do you think if there was a vacancy that she should be considered? Well, I, I don't want to make any assumptions. Uh, you're talking about right now, of course. Uh, I don't want to make any assumptions about what's going to be vacant or not. And I can't talk about it because of the election. But the bottom line is she is so talented and she's so capable and she's got such a great record. I think she's got a bright future. Nobody remembers that there was speculation about you for president. No, well, I can't because I was born in Canada. So I have this constitutional cement ceiling. You and the governor of California, remember yes, that story? Yes, I do, Arnold Schwarzenegger. It, but it still went on for a while, didn't it? Well, uh, ain't going to happen, wasn't going to happen. But, but um, Governor Whitmer is just incredibly talented, and she, she will go far, whatever she wants to do. When's the last time you saw the president up close and personal? Um, I th want to say about a month ago, we had a bilateral meeting in the White House that I was uh, invited to with Poland. Um, we're, we have regular cabinet meetings. We just haven't had them for a couple of months. But I see him uh, regularly. And your take? My take is I am so frustrated by all this talk because he is on top of it. It's just really, uh, it's so frustrating in so many ways. But from my perspective, as somebody who has to present choices to him, he is, he asks 
he's the hardest person to brief because you, he asks questions that you haven't even anticipated. Because of his years of service, he just knows so much. So when you go in to brief him, you better know your stuff because he knows it better than you do. So he is on it. It's so, uh, it's so for all of us cabinet members, it's so frustrating to hear all of this talk as though he, he doesn't have it together when in fact he does. So what happened the other night? You know, Tim, you moderated a number of my debates. I hate debates, and debates have, n the skill of a debate has nothing to do with governing. And sometimes you just freeze, sometimes you just don't have it. And uh, that happened to me on several occasions. I just think it didn't, it didn't happen for him. At that moment in the debate, mm. when he was fumbling with that answer mm. and said, mm. we finally defeated mm. Medicaid, mm. what did you think? I thought to, my, to myself, I thought, oh my God, I can remember when I have fumbled for words and tried to grasp it. I mean, I don't know for, for you if you've ever fumbled for a word because your words are your business, but honestly, it happens to people all the time. And uh, I was, it was a bummer that it happened on such a big stage, but he knows what he's talking about. So is he getting a bum rap on this yes, story? Is yes, the media yes, overplaying this? Yes, yes, yes. Well, that's an easy thing to say. The media overplays a lot of stuff, isn't it? <laughs> well, I'm glad we're holding up a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the truth hurts. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it is. Uh, you know, from just because I have personal experience with him, it is overplayed from our perspective. I understand because people seeing the debate why they would ask legitimate questions. But I'm just saying, from my experience in seeing him on a regular basis, it is just that debate was an anomaly for what he does when he governs. But you're a student of this, okay, and you've been in the arena, the elective mm -hmm. arena. You know, the problem is the people's attention span here, oh, I know. you know, where am I going with yeah, this? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, this, it's this long. Yeah. But could that go either way, too? Well, yes, but if you had 50 million people who saw I know. that, I know. They are the, those 50 million are better right. going up to the cottage up north yeah. and not yeah. now following what's yeah. going it's on. It's the Rorschach right? test, and I, I understand that. Well, you know, I mean, we'll see what happens. Obviously, I can't, again, talk about the election, but I'm just saying that from my experience, I hope that uh, people um, give him the benefit of what he has done as president. I mean, honestly, we got a 3.9% unemployment rate in Michigan, more people employed than ever before. I mean, I only wish that I were governor at a time when I had a partner like you have right now in Washington, because it is really quite amazing. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's, across, it's not just in Michigan, it's across the country. There's over 700 factories that have come back and said that they're opening up. This has never happened before, the amount of manufacturing that's going on, the fact that you have more people nationally working than at, at ever before, the lowest unemployment rate for African Americans, the lowest unemployment rate for Hispanic Americans. I mean, it's just thing after thing. I mean, today we're talking on a day when when the uh, inflation rate ticks down again. We got more work to do, but now it's at three percent or below. I mean, that's it's just the progress is amazing, and compared to other countries, in terms of our GDP growth and everything, we are the envy of the world, and it's because of this president. What scares you about Donald Trump, if anything? Oh my God. Anyway, I can't talk about the election, Tim. I'm Why, so sorry. Oh my God, though. I can't, I just, I, I don't, if I start talking about him, then it's a violation of the Hatch Act, and I can't do that. Okay, uh, it, 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 you would, let me just say this, or ask this, would you be uncomfortable with him as president? Uh, I was, and I would be. Okay. Um, where do you go from here after this? Let's just, let's just. Me, but personally? Yeah. What do you want to be when you grow up? I am, I have the best job in the entire world. I thought being governor of Michigan was It was best. great. It was at a tough time. This is so wonderful because, I mean, I actually wrote a book about this. Um, this I is read so it, by wonderful the way. because I have a boss who believes that we ought to have industrial policy to compete with those competitors globally. And he's putting his money where his mouth is. And it's a, a thoughtful strategy with an incredible team. And I just feel so lucky to be there at this time. Uh, from a strategy standpoint, would it be better off if the dialogue right now was not about that, but about coming together to get him elected? I, I think uh, it is important for people to, I, I think people don't fully realize how much progress is being made on the economy writ large. And so I do think it's important to have a dialogue about well, that. Well, you guys have done a lousy job, my word, not <laughs> yours, of selling this. I mean, you're- Well, that's you're, why I'm here, Tim. Well, yes, but you're three and a half years into the well, mission no, and everybody been. still sits there and he says, well, we, nobody knows what we're doing. Right, we're trying, we're trying. Well, I mean, there's, I mean, I'm just saying that the facts out there on the ground, the fact that he has created 
15.7 million jobs, more than any president in the history of the United States, by far more than his pre predecessor, even if you take out COVID. I mean, the, the GDP growth, by far more than previous president, uh, even if you take out COVID. I mean, there's just the factor after factor after factor is amazing. And I hope people take a full look at his record. What do you miss about the gig back here? Um, you know what, you, it's funny you ask. I miss being in Lansing, honestly. I love Lansing as a city. I just ran along Moore's River Trail last night. And where I just- Where you used to live. Where I used to live. And I just, it's so fantastic. I just love this place. Well, you may love the place, but do you miss the action under the dome? Um, I miss talking to you, Tim. Uh, continue with your answer, okay? <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that, it's very kind of you. Um, I, I, I liked, I mean, I really enjoyed being governor because you felt like you could have impact and it was, it, governors have their finger on the pulse and all of that and so I miss that. Of course, I was governor at a, such a different time and the circumstances were so, so very different but it would be fun to be governor at these times. Finally, if you had one thing to, a, a redo, when you were in office, what would you do over Oh my different? goodness. That's, you've never been asked that before. Wow, if I had a redo, uh, I'll have to think about that too. How about leaving the auto industry out of bankruptcy? Why would I do that as a redo? I think that's, you mean, you, how about leaving them out of bankruptcy? Yeah. Meaning don't, don't re resuscitate? Re yeah. Uh, absolutely not. We want to resuscitate the auto industry and look what's happening today as a result. Yeah, finally, do you miss Mike Bishop? <laughs> Some people I miss a lot. <laughs> I wouldn't put him at the top of my list, but it's good to see you. <laughs> Great to see you too, Tim. Take care. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mike Bishop was a Senate Republican leader the governor had issues with. Uh, thanks for watching. <laughs> we'll see you next week for more Off the Record. <laughs> Production of Off the Record is made possible in part by Martin Waymeyer, a full service strategic communications agency, partnering with clients through public relations, digital marketing, and public policy engagement. Learn more at martinwaymeyer.com. For more Off the Record, visit WKAR.org. Michigan Public Television stations have contributed to the production costs of Off the Record.